good class today. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, it must be the same. Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Margaret Chin, Chair of the Committee on Aging. Thank you all for joining us today. I would like to thank Councilmember Valong, Chair of the Subcommittee on Senior Center, for holding this joint hearing uh, with the Committee on Aging. At today's hearing, the committee will have the opportunity to discuss seniors' access to nutritious and culturally competent meals. New York City is the largest provider of meals in the world, either directly or through contracted providers. In fiscal year 2017, DIFTA alone provided 11.7 million meals to seniors through its congregate meals program at the city's over 250 senior center at, and its home deliver meal programs. These meals are a lifeline to vulnerable low income seniors in the city and we look forward to hearing from the Department for the Aging providers and advocates on the status of these programs, how they can be improved and how we can ensure that all seniors who need these critical service get access to them. I would like to thank the staff of the Committee on Aging for their assistance in putting together this hearing. Our counsel, Caitlin Fahey, policy analyst Emily Rooney, and finance analyst Daniel Coop. I also uh, want to uh, thank the committee members who's going to be joining us later. And now we are going to hear from Councilmember Valong, who is chair of our subcommittee on senior centers. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And with the new year approaching, I think this might be our last co-chair together. So I want to say a special thank you for the amazing uh, tutelage you've given me in my first four years. And I think we made a pretty awesome team in fighting for the seniors. Um, and I think that's something we can all be proud of, the work we've done with DIFTA and everyone over the last four years. And hopefully we're all in very similar roles in the next four years so we can keep the uh, advocacy going. But this is a, a, a good hearing because it's something we're always all fighting for to expand and to grow and to hear how it's been and how the contracts are going. Um, the Department of Aging oversees 250 senior centers throughout the city. They are free and open to anyone over the age of 60 and provide so many different services, including congregate meals, which we're talking about today. In fiscal year 2017, senior centers provided 7.2 million congregate meals to seniors across all of the boroughs. These meals included breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and served five days a week. And in fiscal year 2018, we fought for the baseline of 1.2 million in funding for the six-day congregate meal that so many seniors have asked for uh, and provided a lifeline over the weekend waiting for Monday to come. These meals are critical in the lives of our senior citizens, 13% of whom live in food insecure homes. I look forward to hearing testimony from the Department of Aging, our providers, our advocates regarding DIFICA's congregate meal program and how we can work together to help our seniors provide the services needed for them to continue on with the dignity and respect they deserve. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Uh, we're going to invite up the first panel. Carolyn Resnick, Deputy Commissioner, External Affairs for Department for the Aging. Karen Taylor, Assistant Commissioner, uh, Community Services. And Eileen Malarkey. Oh, Eileen Malarkey, Assistant Commissioner, Long-Term Care. All from DIFTA. So three um, musketeers. <laughs> They're all the time. And all women, yes. Uh, so the council will swear you in. <laughs> Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you for having us here today. Good afternoon. Happy holidays to one and all. Um, I'm Karen Resnick, Deputy Commissioner for External Affairs at the New York City Department for the Aging. And I am joined by Karen Taylor, Assistant Commissioner for Community Services, and Eileen Malarkey, Assistant Commissioner for Long-Term Care. On behalf of Commissioner Donna Corrado, I'd like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss seniors' access to nutritional and culturally competent congregate and home delivered meals. DIFTA contracted organizations provide, as you mentioned, 11.7 million meals in FY17, including both home delivered meals and congregate meals at senior centers. Central to DIFTA's mission is to ensure the dignity and quality of life of New York's diverse older adults 
and providing culturally sensitive services is tantamount to supporting that mission. DIFTA currently sponsors 246 senior centers and 29 affiliated satellites throughout the five boroughs, which are funded at $139 million. The satellites include senior social clubs previously opera operated by NYCHA and former discretionary programs that were baselined. As you know, in addition to offering a broad range of programs and services, senior centers provide meals at little or no cost to participants though modest contributions are accepted and are completely voluntary. In FY17, approximately 29,500 older New Yorkers participated in activities and received meals at DIFTA-sponsored senior centers each day. Senior centers served a total of 7.2 million congregate meals, including breakfast, lunch, and dinner. All DIFTA-sponsored senior centers serve meals that meet city and state nutritional standards and strive to be culturally relevant to program participants. Kosher meal programs are available at senior centers in all five boroughs. A number of senior centers <coughs> in Brooklyn, Manhattan, and Queens serve meals that are culturally appropriate to their Chinese constituents, including senior centers in Chairperson Chin's district. In Queens, Korean Community Services of Metropolitan New York, Inc., provides Korean meals at the DIFTA senior center they operate in Flushing in Chairperson's Valone District, as well as at another site in Corona. In the Bronx, several senior centers serve Spanish and Latin American fare as the preference of their constituents. Other senior centers offer Indian, Italian, Southern, and Caribbean meals to meet constituents' needs. Some DIFTA senior centers celebrate and observe the national holidays of their diverse program participants as a way of incorporating traditional customs. <coughs> Through cultural Sharing and exchanges enriched by educational programming and translation services, senior centers foster sensitivity and appreciation for different cultures among a diverse membership, which break down cultural barriers in centers that have undergone demographic changes. The Home Delivered Meals Program provides nutritious meals to older New Yorkers while creating greater choice to address the future needs of a growing homebound population. All home-delivered meals meet prescribed dietary guidelines. Those older adults assessed by the, their case manager as capable of handling a frozen meal have choice and flexibility between choosing twice-weekly delivery of frozen meals or daily delivery of a hot meal. The selection of frozen meal delivery provides the option to decide when clients are ready to eat and which meal they wish to eat that day. In FY17, more than 26,500 homebound seniors received nearly 4.5 million home-delivered meals. Home-delivered meals are funded at $37 million. <coughs> in addition to the 3.3 million that was baselined in FY15 to address rising food costs for congregate and home-delivered meals, the administration added baseline funding of $1.8 million in FY16 to expand the capacity of the Home Delivered Meals Network by 5%. This funding resulted in 200,000 additional Home Delivered Meals for seniors in need. DIFTA's Home Delivered Meal Program includes a variety of culturally relevant meals and menus. The Department for the Aging requires that menus are reviewed in terms of nutritional standards as well as cultural relevance as determined by the demographics of HDML clients. Reflecting this diversity, more than 22% of meals delivered citywide are kosher. For example, clients living in Lower Manhattan are offered Chinese meals, clients in Greenpoint, Brooklyn are delivered Polish meals, and clients residing in Queens receive Korean meals. DIFTA engaged PricewaterhouseCoopers as a consultant in order to identify the means by which the city could better structure the home delivered meals program to improve the efficiency and quality of the program for older New Yorkers. PwC received feedback from HDML stakeholders in New York City and nationally to pinpoint what works well and what needs improvement in the way that food is procured, prepared, and delivered to homebound seniors. Currently, DIFTA holds 23 contracts with 17 community-based organizations to deliver approximately 18,000 meals per day. It is the agency's vision to build capacity and improve its food service delivery across the city by broadening menu options, 
addressing consumer choice, increasing program efficiency, controlling costs, leveraging technology and emerging platforms, and tailoring males, meals to meet the nutritional needs of diverse constituents. After extensive interviews, analysis, and field work, PwC presented findings to DIFTA on how to improve meal quality, expand choice, and develop greater efficiencies where possible. We are analyzing these results as they help to inform our retooling of the overall system in the future. After obtaining stakeholder input, DIFTA plans to release an RFP for home delivered con meals contracts beginning in 2020. I thank you again for this opportunity to testify on seniors' access to nutritional and culturally competent congregate and home delivered meals, and I'm pleased to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. That was like getting to the end of the TV show at the end of the season. We're just about to get the conclusion, and boom, we're going to wait to 2020. No, I, was, I was all excited. It was like, wait a minute. We got those results coming. Well, we want you to leave lots of time no, for it's discussion. Like, tune in next year for the, for the conclusion of the diff. All right, so with, with that expanding the vision, just if we can expand on that a little bit more, the timeline, where do you see? Because that's where we all really want to be, the expanding of the food service, addressing the costs, more of the culturally competent meals, uh, technology, all of that that you had at the end. Wh where do you see that on the timeline? So as I mentioned, we engaged um, Waterhouse Coopers, and we are not yet ready to move forward with the next phase, but we are hoping that in the new year we will begin to look at different models um, and look at ways in which we can implement at least some of those strategies. It may be too much to take on that whole reform package at one time. So I think that's part of the next step of work is to figure out if this can be staged or piloted or actually now start to drill down and see what different options look like. I think that would be very prudent for us to kind of work on what are the most attainable ones we can hit exactly. first. Some of the low hanging fruit that we can maybe address while we look at long term uh, dream projects, you know, I think that's, it's a lot of it comes down to budget and fiscal, but that's our right. job is to fight with you to, to make sure that this year that we continue our, every year is the year of the senior. Um, <laughs> these would be, these would be things that we'd like to really expand on. The, the 23,000 meals and 18, 23 contracts, sorry, 18,000 per day. Um, how has that changed? I think we were talking about the last time we brought this up about your. I don't have the exact numbers, but we know, in fact, well, I mean, might, but our overall home delivered meals numbers have gone up, um, and we had additional dollars that allowed us to do that. So I don't know if you have any. Have we met the current add? demand, I guess, with what we're doing now? Is that the wait list or? Um, we, hmm. we ended the year a little bit underutilized, so there is still room uh, for more clients to, uh, to receive meals. Um, every once in a while, there'll be like a small wait list, and it's really about a meal provider having to start a new route, and then that quickly gets um, absorbed so we don't have clients waiting. So there, there really, at this point, are no clients, or should be no clients waiting for meals. Is that absorbed by an existing provider? or By existing providers, and because we have, um, uh, we were slightly underutilized. We, you know, have some room if uh, one provider uh, ends up having uh, more growth in their area that we could, you know, shift funds to them to be able to have that. So I, we're constantly asked and requested for an increase within culturally specific type of meals. And I know the cost reimbursement has always been something that we had. Could we expand a little bit on what the cost per meal for senior centers is today and where we see it? Is it something that we can address going forward? So senior centers is a whole other mm -hmm. uh, topic, and we are right now engaged with OMB in, in very serious drilling down into every single budget line of our senior center budgets um, to come up with actually what are those costs and, and what are realistic goals. So we are... I think right on target to be able to announce that model budget um, at the beginning of this year, so only a few weeks away. Um, costs for home delivered meals 
it's funded a little bit differently, and that's actually on a per meal basis as opposed to senior centers, which is still really a line item budget. Um, so Eileen can perhaps comment about what the per meal cost is. We were able to get a differential for the cost of kosher meals, but right. I don't believe that we do have differential for culturally competent other meals. Right, we, we don't uh, differentiate for that. The um, When there was the increase for uh, the regular meals and then the kosher meals, it ended up to be a blended rate. Um, and then this year there's the cola, so people's rates will be going up um, based on that as well. Minimum wage has gone up, so that'll affect some of our meal programs in terms of their, their staff. Well, and the overall service and the amount of meals and staff, or just will that all be increased to reflect the minimum wage? I don't want to reduce what we're providing because we're increasing. No, it's on top of it. It's on top. Yeah. So it, that will all help to raise what the actual overall reimbursement rate is. But we have heard, and I know you will hear later, from advocates who are- We love our advocates. We do uh -huh. love them, and I see all of my friends out there. Um, there has been some organizing and the beginning, I think, of advocacy around raising that meal rate. So we are aware of that, and that's being taken into consideration as we move forward with both of the plans for the future of home delivered meals as well as senior centers. And senior centers, you said, would be addressed in early next year? Yes. Okay, that's gonna be very important. Um, especially when we added that six, six day meal that affects so many seniors have contacted us as to how that provides that critical meal for the weekend and for the extra day until we get them over to, to Monday. So we appreciate that that was baseline and included. Um, and I'll turn over to our chair just with a Final question as to the, the providers that are handling like the Chinese and the, and the Korean type of <coughs> meals. What's the update as to the current meals that are being provided versus the demand? Are we meeting the demand for those for those areas, like with the Chinese meals and the Korean meals? Because I know in my district it's astronomical, the increase of the amount of Asian-related meals that are being requested. Uh, we are in uh, Queens, for example, there's one provider who uh, subcontracts with all the home delivered meal programs in Queens, and anytime someone requests a, a Korean meal, they're authorized for that, and the agency that um, handles this subcontract, they've been able to absorb all the clients that get referred to who, them. Who, who handles Korean American services. But which your DIFTA is with directly? Uh, the, no, there's, I think, five home-delivered meal programs in Queens, and each of those programs subcontracts with Korean American for, to, the, Korean for the Korean meals. So anyone in Queens who wants a Korean-style meal, they're able to get one. Okay, and so that's been, how long has it been, five? Uh, a couple years now. And that's been able to meet the demand? Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. I'd be curious to follow up with that. Yeah. But thank you very much, everyone. You're Karen. Welcome. Yeah, I just want to follow up on, on that one question that you said that in your testimony there are 23 contracts with 17 uh, community-based organizations. So do you know how many subcontractors um, are included in that? Um, we, we can get back to you on the exact number of subcontractors. There's, there's two different kinds of subcontractors. Um, one is the lead agency subcontracts, like with the example with Korean American. And then there's also um, home delivered meal programs that cook, and then others that subcontract with, say, like a caterer. So, so it's a couple of different levels of subcontracting, but we can get back to you and give you the exact numbers. And also the question is, another question relating to that is, how many are any senior center um, cooking the home delivered meal? There's about are, they, are they like the subcontractor or are they one of the primary uh, organization that you have to contract with? It's a, oh. it's a combination, um, and I think there's about seven uh, senior centers that cook either as a main contract or, or as a subcontractor. Yeah, if you could provide us with those data, yeah. you know, which are the subcontractor, which mm -hmm. are the senior center that's providing the meal. Because in previous hearing, right, Council Member Ballone? We have heard from groups that are subcontracting and they feel like they were not uh, able or they were not allowed to do the outreach to let people know that 
these kind of culturally um, meals are available. I mean, there's definitely more demand uh, than what is being provided now. So the issue is like, how do we make sure that every uh, vulnerable senior who really needs mm -hmm. a home delivered meal gets it? Um, and relating to that too is the sixth meal. Now we baseline 1.2 million, um, but I think that there's a lot more demand uh, from the center uh, for that sixth meal. I know that DIFTA in the past had just like, oh, we survey the centers and they really don't want it, but that's not what we're hearing. Uh, so that's the, the question is like whether 1.2 million is enough, uh, sufficient to cover. And the other relating to that is that what would it cost to have senior center open on the weekend and provide um, the congregate meal on the weekend? Uh, because I have, you know, centers in my district who have asked or who have done in the past that they will open either six days um, and some even seven days. Uh, so it just kind of seemed like, you know, seniors need that a congregate meal and the socialization practically seven days a week, but they're only there five days a week. Mm -hmm. So I think going forward, are you looking at what uh, it would cost for centers if they do want to provide that congregate meal on site, right, uh, on, on the weekend, uh, and, um, and also whether the 1.2 is enough, is sufficient to cover the six meals right now? We can get back to you definitely on the 1.2 million and how it's planned to be spent this year. Uh, because it was baselined, we want to be sure that programs understand that those meals will now be a permanent part of their contracts and that that's an obligation as well as a benefit. So we're, we're going through that process now. Um, Clearly, I agree. I mean, I think we all agree that it would be wonderful if there were more centers open for congregate services on the weekends rather than just providing a meal for someone to take home. That would be great. Um, there are very few centers that are able to do that, uh, some on a part-time basis, some on a full-time basis. Um, so that would be a wonderful goal for perhaps a long-term goal. Uh, because we have so many other needs within the current system that we're, as, as Karen mentioned earlier, that we've been working very closely with OMB to try to address just to bring the current system up to a level where they have more capacity to, to meet the current needs. Um, but that should be included while we, you're figuring mm -hmm. what is we the, do that. Yeah. you know, the model budget. So mm -hmm. what it would be to really have the best senior, you know, run senior center with all the activities and open seven days a week so that we know what the goal is, what we could mm -hmm. be fighting for. Uh, so that should be included in your budgeting model. I'm sure we can extrapolate and <laughs> come up with something. Well, it's kind of like how the libraries, at some points, there'll be right. some branch or some place yeah, on the sixth we'll or seventh day, and I think yeah. that would be yeah. at least somewhere within the borough. We know in certain sections there'll be certain places on an emergency basis mm -hmm. that could provide mm -hmm. a sixth or a seventh day. Mm -hmm. I think that's a wonderful idea. Right. and then to see how and it works on a trial basis and, we and can, maybe try to expand. We can let you know there are some programs that are open, if not a sixth day, that are open on a weekend. Some of our kosher programs open on a Sunday, may close on a Friday and open on a Sunday so that there is a little bit of carryover in whatever those communities are, but we'll, we can let you know the programs that do have weekend days as well. Well, I think the chair touched on something beyond today's scope, but we'll talk about in early next year is our senior center funding and how they're able to handle the increased costs across the board. This is just one small segment of the overall costs of the operation of a senior center, the staffing of a senior center, the insurance, the programs, the contracts, the uh, social workers, everything that's part of it and the meals. I think the, the push that you're feeling now just on this is just <coughs> one part of all of that. So I think that's going to be a big part of how we have to fight for so we don't decrease programs right. or services or have to pick it up on separate ways through council budget or individual council members. Um, this is important and we want to advocate for these as much funding as we can get. I think we can't ignore that there's a whole portion of senior center funding that is really at risk 
if we keep things status quo. You, you mentioned the RFP in 2020. I thought that was going to be a little before that. But weren't we talking about maybe doing the contracts and subcontracts with food vendors? This, the next RFP is going to be in 2020? So the RFP would be probably a year before. Okay, it takes us a whole year to it's like the voice. approve them and get them. <laughs> it's the wizard behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so wait, one more time. So the RFP within a year and then contract. The 2020 is that contracts would begin in 2020. So that okay. means it takes us about a whole year to procure, go through the process, and award contracts. Because that was part of, I think, the ask was the increase in the RFP provide and, and the, what we could do within the RFP so that we can now have groups like KCS that provided right. the meals to have additional. Okay, thank you, Julie. Um, would Zifta uh, share with us the, the, the Price Waterhouse uh, findings that, um, so that we can also take a look at what some of the suggestions and. Sure, absolutely. Okay, because that's the first time we've heard about it, so that'll be good, all right? Now, the other question. This whole voluntary contribution <laughs> for congregate and home deliver meal. Yes. All right. So, what was the purpose behind this whole voluntary contribution? And do you know how many seniors contribute? How much money is collected? What the funds are used for? And who set the rates for the voluntary contribution? Because it differs from center to center. Um, because one of the conversations that I was having with my colleague is we were so successful um, in getting universal free lunch for our student and the department, you know, yes, in our school. Wonderful. I said, what about universal free lunch for our seniors? Uh, because it's the same issue. The whole stigma, I mean, some seniors on fixed income just cannot afford that $1.75, $1.50, or a dollar a day contri voluntary contribution. And if they don't contribute, um, it makes them feel bad. Uh, because the minute you walk into some of the center, that's the first table that you come across. Uh, so if you can go through the history yes. of, of this whole volunteer contribution. And also, we heard that Meals on Wheels, I mean, a home deliver meal, also are supposed to ask for a volunteer contribution. So if you can go through the history of that. Yes. So this wasn't our bright idea, but it was of our forefathers in 1965 when the Older Americans Act was put in place. Um, the nutrition programs, Title C1, C2, C3 of the Older Americans Act all talk about providing nutritious meals to seniors over 60, and they put the provision in for voluntary contributions. Um, as you know, the programs are not means tested. None of the Older Americans Act programs are based on income. And so I think there were a number of reasons behind the cost share, which is simply that you have some skin in the game and that because they are essentially free, we're asking people, can you or would you help contribute to the cost? There should not be stigma. Nobody should be watching who puts what in the bucket. Um, we certainly have had complaints about that. Um, and then it's kind of all over the place. There tends to be an inverse relationship, counterintuitive, that anecdotally at least we think that sometimes in the poorer communities the contribution level is higher than in more affluent communities. So it's not necessarily tied to one's income status. It's I guess the same way as if you pass the hat anywhere. There are people who feel more obliged to be charitable. But um, it's not passing the hat. It's like no, you're right. a ticket. It's at, or a ticket the, at the, the front minute door. you walk in, um, I had one of my first We are required meal, to ask. And I, you know. <laughs> and, we are and we do require that our centers post. Um, it's part of the Older Americans Act that there be a sign posted. DIFTA does not set the contribution amount. Um, historically, there were times when we did suggest the suggested contribution. Uh, that has been under discussion again recently, um, actually raising what the suggested contribution amount is, um, not talking about eliminating it. 
but actually raising it. Because there is a very wide disparity across our whole net center network, and I th some, some seniors find that um, uncomfortable, that you go to one center and it's $1.25, and another center it's three. So we, we have been talking internally about should there be a uniform suggested contribution. But we are not at liberty to um, dissolve that. That's but you both must a have federal and a state regulation. But you must we, have some data in terms of how much we do. We know uh, how much a center collect. collects we do. And, and what they use the funding for. I mean, if they're using that funding to supplement the meal budget, then it's the problem. You know, then they're not getting enough uh, reimbursement rate for the meal. I mean, there's got to be some kind of like statistic look at what is, how much money are they collecting and and what you know the funding is used for. I mean, there's different ways of looking at contribution. Yeah, if there was a box there and I could just put whatever I want to put, mm -hmm. if I could afford more, I can put more. Right. And for some seniors that that come to the center, some of them are still working. And to them, maybe you know, dollar twenty-five exactly. is really cheap. Uh, but they could afford five dollars, or maybe they can give, you know, three dollars or, or five dollars. Um, but the way it is set up now, it's sort of like you're buying a ticket. I mean, that's the front line. The minute you walk in there, uh, you're you're expected to pay whatever the amount that the center is uh, is asking for, and so that is something that. We really need to visit. Uh, if the center does not have enough money to run, they cannot. I mean, if that is a fundraising um, project in terms of charging for the meal, you know, that's something that we should look at. I mean, yeah, everyone could contribute. You have an event, you have a fundraising event, mm -hmm. everybody can contribute. Uh, or nominally, you, you put in a quarter, but paying $3 or $1.75, would you look at how many people attend to center and, and the kind of you know, population that attend you know, different center, you can see that there's something that's not totally equal um, in a way. So I think that is something that we really need to look at in terms of this so-called volunteer contribution. Do you have anything we to have say? Some, yes, yeah. we have some data from last spring that we can share. Oh, we we did an exercise, I believe it was last spring, um, on this that we can share with you. I'll dig it up. That, that goes over all of the, the amount of contributions that are collected, kind of what the average is and what each site collects and what each site is asking. So we'll share that with you. Yeah, that, that would be um, you know, helpful. Because like for, let's say for the senior center, I know that in previously in the past has been that some center, because they overserve, then they get um, the extra money um, at the end of the fiscal year if there's any money funding left over. Mm -hmm. Now, is it true that each center is, um, their contract is based on the number of meals that they serve? Do we have any statistic uh, about numbers of seniors that get turned away that shows up and they say, oh, we don't, we don't have any more food because we served out everyone today. Um, do we, the DIFTA collect any data? Turn away now if we. I think maybe Open Door might be the only place where that happens, <laughs> where polling actually runs out of tickets. <laughs> but our other centers, you know, if they can't feed everybody because of the facility, they'll do multiple seatings. But it's very rare that the people are turned away because there's not enough food. That's not, that's not really a yeah. systemic issue. Actually. So you don't hear that from the center because we've heard, I've heard from a senior that it shows up at, you know, that's it. All the meals are, are served. We have, uh, we have an, uh, there are occasions where we hear that as well, especially at centers that cater because they yeah. arrange for certain number of catered meals yeah. to be delivered every day. And if some days they get more than anticipated, they don't, there's very little they can do they are supposed to and they do adjust their catering order so that they hopefully can accommodate anybody who comes so but it does happen every now and then where they they get more people than expected and can't can provide or they have to provide sort of an alternative meal 
uh, but system light our issue is a little bit more on the other side that there is still capacity for more people to come and get meals at senior centers that we'd love to have come so also is, is DIFTA would be looking at new contract model uh, for senior centers and home delivery meal program that allow for the contract reimbursement rates to be adjusted with the price of food you know fluctuates because one of the oh, complaints that we had is like you know yeah like a cold over that food cost is going up but the reimbursement rate is still the same and that's what we keep hearing over and over again from provider that there is no adjustment because um, contract was signed years yes. ago and nothing changed yeah. <coughs> we're taking meal especially costs. with the ethnic meals right? yes because they're always more expensive so obviously meal cost is part of the parsing of the budget process that we're going through i don't know that we're actually looking at building in a specific cola for meals i mean there's the now cola for overall contracts and changes in indirect rates um, that will add money to contracts and i think ease some of the burden about the meal rate okay i mean that's part of it that you should be talking to the provider and ask them for suggestions, right? Is there a- Every uh, day. I'm sure they'll let you know too. Um, <laughs> is there a difference uh, in cost between um, meals that are prepared by the center and meals that are catered? Do you have any um, statistic on that? There, is, there are differences, yes. Um, although I'm not sure we have an exact answer to that, but but clearly there are differences. It depends some, on so many other factors, how many staff you have in your kitchen, what kind of, how many meals you're preparing in your kitchen versus what kind of meals you're catering, what you're, you know, so there's a lot of data that we can certainly give you, but I believe it's, um, there's really no rule of thumb on that, is there? Was, yeah. I mean, would that affect, yeah. affect the cost? I mean, is it, do you find that it's cheaper in the long run if you have your own kitchen, you prepare your own food, um, versus if you cater um, outside, that's one thing. Mm -hmm. that's it's not an obvious answer. Yeah. So sometimes yes, sometimes no. And because of that, it depends on the staffing pattern and the operating cost. And if you have a particularly good rate with a caterer, it could actually be mm -hmm. less expensive. So does SIFTA do something with the center uh, economy by scale, like in terms of purchasing um, certain food item together? I mean, like, it seems like every senior has a little container of milk, right? So that's, that's one of the recommendations, um, certainly around home delivered meals, is the concept of is there a better way to procure food, you know, on either with DIFTA doing it or on behalf of the providers, and that would hold true for the senior centers as well. Um, so I think that's one of the ways that we can try to bring costs down and then and that we're looking at. And also can you share with us in terms of like we have 270 senior center? <laughs> I know that we have Sorry. more social adult daycare than senior center. <laughs> we have about 275 sites that are senior programs, co congregate programs that we have. Um, you know, our basic 246 senior centers, and then we have satellites and social clubs and other affiliate, affiliate senior center type programs. Yes. So do you know how many of them have their own kitchen and cook their own meal, and how many um, cater? Do you have that breakdown? Do you know off the top of your head? Elisa Dinses is our Head nutritionist, director of nutrition, and I think she has the answer to that question. About, one, about 120 adult cooks. So, in terms of meals, one fifty. Yeah, you put your money on it. There's one fifty in there somewhere. So, about 120 adult cooks. 70 of those you can bring your own from a commercial caterer. The other 50 would be just from other senior centers. Okay. Can you do, read, say that again on the record in the mic? 120 of the 270 programs do not cook for themselves. But then the, of, the, of, of the remainder, no, of, no, the, of, the of the 120, about 70 are 
Okay, 70 are from commercial caterers. Oh, the other 50 are what we used to call DIFTA to DIFTA. So one senior center is preparing excess meals and delivering them to another senior center. Don't ask me to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> well, you should know that by heart, Carolyn. Okay, I expect it changes. that. It, cha I mean, it, it changes. Thank you. But I think that that is something to really look at, um, helping senior center to really have that capacity of you know preparing their own meal. They have their own kitchen, uh, and a lot of them need to be upgraded. Uh, but there's probably a, a cost savings <laughs> there. Um, and also going forward, if we want to talk about more, um, you know, from farm to table, you know, more fresh vegetables, more locally grown products. Yes, I think you ultimately, so yeah, the nutrition. How has the nutritional aspect of our meals changed over the last year or so? I know we were talking about trying to incorporate some more, um, you know, nutritionally beneficial meals, but again, that brings up a cost and versus taste versus the ability and all that. How, how, how are we today with nutrition on the meals? Um, actually, we've done quite a bit. The nutrition unit, uh, well, I'm speaking for senior centers at this point. Um, I think they've worked very hard with programs, and some programs have really stepped up and are doing some amazing things uh, with or without DIFTA's encouragement. Um, but our, <coughs> our nutritionists look for those kinds of uh, assets that, uh, that a program may be able to have uh, and gives them technical assistance on how to incorporate more fresh food. It sometimes is a challenge um, when uh, there are certain dietary habits that different populations are used to. I, I, the, the big one, of course, was the reduction in sodium, which was a big uh, hurdle to get over, but I think we've kind of been there, and I think you'll probably hear from some of the other providers later on a little bit about their experiences. But we, yes, I think we have come a long way. I don't have an exact numbers for you, but um, we see a lot more of that, and we see a lot more participation in the farmers' markets and things like that as well. Well, I think that's what the chair just brought up. Do, do we have any numbers on the increase of the farmer market and the farm to table? And even the schools now are starting to have their own gardens, and that'd be a wonderful way to expand locally. I don't know if we have numbers, future, but we, we can certainly get. can talk about different programs yeah, that are program. doing all kinds of incredible things. You're going to hear from some of them today, I think. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we've been joined by uh, Council Member Deutsch, and just another question on uh, wait lists. So um, is there any current uh, case management wait lists, and how many of those seniors would qualify for home delivered meal? There's about 1,100 clients who are on the case management wait list, but what it means is they're waiting for a case manager to visit them at home. So when these clients uh, get connected to the case management agency, they have a mini assessment over the phone. If they need meals, meals are initiated before the case management case manager visits. These clients are also called every two months. So if it was a client where they screened them and they felt like they really need a home visit, they wouldn't be on the wait list. They, they would be visited. But clients that they feel <coughs> can manage safely at home with the meal until the case manager can visit, um, they stay on the wait list until case management can absorb them. So out of the 1,100, do we know how many have a home delivered meal? I, I would estimate 90% of them. Okay. Why are there still 1,100 people on seniors on wait lists for case management? I thought we provided the funding uh, to eliminate the wait list, and this is December. Carolyn, the money didn't yeah. get out the door? I mean, what's going on? I mean, it, it does take some time to get the money to the programs, for the programs to hire, to onboard them. So even programs who have staffed up, they can't, like, first day give the new workers 65. So it is a process to build up. But we're hoping that, you know, it continues to get better over the year. That being said, you know, there's always new people new coming the into, the, into the system. So as we clean up the wait list, then the next wave... Group. The next wave comes on, and then sometimes there is a lag. 
So now you sound like us. That's what we always say. <laughs> no, that's what now. <laughs> OMB never admitted that there was a wait list, yes. right? Yes. And nice. say <laughs> people need service. If you're going to provide it, they will come, and uh, that's why we need uh, additional funding every year because the senior population uh, is growing and the need is there. Uh, Councilmember Doyle, do you have a question for the panel? If you insist. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good afternoon. I, I just have a question. Uh, you don't have to go through the numbers again, uh, but from the 240, the sources that uh, the food is prepared. So you have catered meals. So can you just go over like oh, from, from how many? No, no, not the, <laughs> You don't have to give me the numbers. Just only from from how many different sources does uh, the meals get prepared? So you have one is like could be from a so caterer. So cooking on site okay. in the senior centers, and then catered through a commercial caterer and then catered by another senior center. So a senior center that has a very large kitchen may cook and prepare not only for their own programs, but then drop off and deliver to other programs. So, so do you know the three wh different what, is the, that we, what is the difference in cost per meal? We just, we just went over that, and it, it turns out that it, it's not that one is more or less expensive than the other, because all no, no, things no, no, are no, not no, no. My question is, what is the cost? Like, approximately, what is the cost? Is it a dollar oh. fifty meal, a dollar meal? How oh. much would it come out to? Yeah. Uh, for a for a senior center yeah. meal. Yeah. Senior center meal. Um, prepared meal, yeah. The actual cost of just the food, and this is without the the staffing allocation and everything, just the food itself, I think ranges from a very on the very low end about what two, almost a little under three dollars up to seven or eight dollars a meal. Wow. And okay, and um, and all this is city, strictly city funded. Nothing from the state. Do you ever get anything from the state that no, goes through meals? No, the, the majority is federally funded. Federally funded. So so um, the free lunch program for schools that costs about a dollar fifty, right? Approximately dollar fifty because I kept on asking for a kosher and halal option. Right. They said no, we can't go over dollar fifty. It's too expensive. Right. So I was just curious to com to compare it to the. To the, to, the, to the meals that, um, that we give to the senior centers, to the seniors, compared to DOE, what they provide for our kids. Right. Because I think $1.50 is kind of low to give a good nutritional meal. It should be, the numbers should be like like Department of Aging has, because that is a good meal and people walk away and, the, and they don't have to look for a second, uh, a second meal or a second snack. But the $1.50 is kind of pretty low when you're talking about our children, right? So I just want to see the comparison between um, the so free one lunch. Of the different, I, I mean, I can't comment on whether it's, it's too low or not, but one of the, the big differences is DOE does their own procuring and they are, are preparing meals on site. So there's much more cost control than what we have in our current system with over 100 different sponsors and cooking or catering and preparing in different ways and procuring food in different ways. Some people buy from their local grocer in the neighborhood, and you know others buy from big, large. And those are some of the things we're looking at, at ways in which that you know we can possibly do better on, on procurement throughout the system. Right, okay. But I would imagine that's yeah. part of why DOE can do a meal at a much lower price point. Uh, OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're also joined by uh, Councilmember Koskowitz. Councilmember, do you have any question for the panel? I have like six minutes. Okay. We did talk about your six meals. Okay. Making sure that they have to let us know whether they need more money to make sure every senior who wants it gets it. Um, any other questions we have for the panel? Um, okay. One last question is that besides uh, Senior center, home deliver meals, uh, are there any other way that uh, a low income senior can ask, you know, access a uh, nutritious meal oh. from the city? Food pantry? Yes, we're, we're actually uh, looking at that uh, at this very moment. But yes, of course, there are food pantries throughout the city of New York. Um, you're going to hear very soon from our partner, City Meals, which does deliveries for holidays and weekends and does um, bags, grocery bags of um, 
non-perishable goods. Um, there are now some mobile food pantries. So there are many other ways that somebody who's, who's hungry can access meals. But of course, we'd like seniors, anybody over 60, to come join us in the center because there's all the rest of the wealth and activity that goes on there and so much more than just the meal. OK, well, thank you so much. Thank um, you. Thank you. For happy coming holidays. today. Happy holidays. Happy and uh, happy holidays. we look forward to continuing to working with you. It's been a very productive four years. And um, we had a victory this year with the year of the senior budget. And we're going to move forward uh, to make sure we build on the gains that we've made. So, and thank you. And uh, we're going to call up the next panel. William Dione from uh, Carter Burton Network, uh, Ariel Savransky, UJA Federation, uh, Danielle Christensen from God's Love We Deliver, and Sh Rachel Cheryl from City Meals on Wheels. There you are, Rachel. You're hiding on us. Yes, you should go first. OK, you may begin. All right. Uh, my name is Rachel Sharrow. I'm the Associate Executive Director at City Meals on Wheels. And I just want to begin by thanking Council for your continued support of aging services, especially um, past year of the senior, which was an incredible win for all of us. And we're greatly appreciative. And uh, we know it's going to continue this year. Um, as you know, City Meals is a not-for-profit working in partnership with the Department for the Aging, as well as all of the providers who provide home-delivered meals, as Karen described. We deliver meals on uh, weekends, holidays, and in emergencies. So homebound elderly New Yorker will not go without food any day of the year and have some extra. I'm sorry about that. There was extra paper in our printer, and so some private stuff was attached to the back of that. <laughs> <laughs> pre-net neutrality. Um, <laughs> so as um, uh, you'll hear from my colleagues and other advocates, studies suggest that one in four senior citizens living in our communities is malnourished. Uh, according to Hunger Free America, there's been a 25% increase in food security in the senior population. And a hunger study conducted by Live on New York shows this to mean basically that 35% of older adults in New York City are living with food insecurity or hunger. They're just literally hungry. Um, Meals on Wheels is a very vital service for our homebound elderly to prevent hunger, decrease isolation, and ensure our older neighbors can remain in their homes and live within their communities and neighborhoods as they wish. However, having the right nutrition is also crucial for this population. And for years, the system has relied on community-based organizations which know their local populations and cultural tradi to traditions to prepare and deliver those meals appropriate to their meal recipients. However, as the city's neighborhoods have shifted uh, demographically and a more diverse group of older adults live together, having only one choice for a meal no longer works. In addition, City Meals undertook a study with the Columbia University Dental School, which showed that there are meal recipients unable to eat part of their meals due to oral health issues, therefore missing essential nutrients and not fulfilling the benefits of Meals on Wheels. Thus, we need to offer choice and diversity in what we serve, both culturally and therapeutically, to best serve this vulnerable population. 
Um, for example, in addition to funding the weekend meals for homebound elderly, City Meals prepares over 600,000 shelf-stable meals at our warehouse for holiday weekends and emergencies. All of our food is kosher, which enables all of our recipients to accept it and eat the food. However, we would love to be able to offer a better variety. For example, to serve those who are gluten-free or vegan, uh, setting aside all the therapeutic needs that, that we, our clients have. Um, hopefully, with the, the partnership of DIFTA, we hope that the near future, and obviously the RFP, which I'm still, just want to clarify if it's calendar 2020 or, f thank you, Janine, I've got it. All right. Yes, no, I love it. Um, hopefully, uh, this will help our uh, recipients have greater choice for taste, culture, and oral health needs. However, this cannot happen without an investment in our system for both nutritional education, so our centers actually know how to prepare these special meals, and appropriate funding, which covers the cost of both the meal and delivery and all the components involved, including administrative costs, with increases based on the increase in prices. And you talked about the COLA's cost of um, really just the consumer price index. Milk goes up every year. How can, we, um, how can we keep up with those growing costs? We should also look toward modernizing the system as a whole to include technology and accessibility to make the delivery process more efficient and to push information out about the recipients faster. This is 2017. We live in New York City. Uh, we shouldn't be writing on pieces of paper anymore. Bringing a meal to the door is one less struggle for the homebound to worry about financially. In addition, this food delivery is one way to prevent them from slipping into more expensive kinds of care. And evidence does support the fact, it really does support the fact that programs like Meals on Wheels, which allow older adults to age in place, may help save costs for families, governments, and our health system. This also benefits caregivers who know, who are uh, able to go about their daily um, activities knowing that a meal is coming to the door. Um, so hopefully we will be able to do this, and as we move into our 36th year as City Meals, we again thank Council and our partners, um, our grassroots organizations and DIFTA, and we hope that we can help this process move along. Good afternoon, Chairperson Chin, Chairperson Vallone, and members of the Committee on Aging and Subcommittee on Senior Centers. My name is Arielle Savransky, and I'm an advocacy and policy advisor at UJA Federation of New York. On behalf of UJA, our network of nonprofit partners and those we serve, thank you for the opportunity to, to testify on seniors' access to nutritional and culturally competent congregate and home-delivered meals. You have my longer testimony, and Rachel actually uh, made a lot of the points that I was planning on speaking about, so I'm going to be pretty brief in my, um, in my testimony today. Um, I would like to start off as well by thanking the council and the administration for the historic investments in DIFTA core programs in FY18. Our nonprofit partners provide vital services and supports to New Yorkers. We are also the largest provider through our core partners of kosher food. The high cost of a kosher meal presents a unique challenge for many of our agencies in their work. Furthermore, as Rachel spoke about before, while food insecurity rates among most New Yorkers have declined, there has been an increase among seniors. Additionally, food pantries and soup kitchens continue to see increased visitor traffic and many report experiencing food shortages. As evidenced by these numbers and the increased nutritional requirements for seniors, there is an immense need for access to nutritional and culturally appropriate meals for this population. We offer the following recommendations. First, increase reimbursement rates for kosher meals. As discussed previously, the high cost of a kosher meal pre presents a unique challenge for many of our agencies. Providing culturally sensitive meal services for seniors is a priority for us, and we are particularly concerned about reimbursement rates for kosher home-delivered meals. Second, we urge you to explore ways to maintain access to culturally appropriate home-delivered meals for Holocaust survivors which is essential to addressing the food insecurity that is often found in this population. Furthermore, beyond simple meal provision, home-delivered meals provide important social contact for those who are confined to their homes. It acts as an access point for other important services and helps survivors to age safely and in place. Lastly, we urge continued investment in expanding the anti-hunger safety net through enrollment in programs such as SNAP, as well as the Emergency Food Assistance Program. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify today, and we look forward to working with you to address this important topic. Thank you. 
Thank you, Chair Chen and Chair Vallone and the committee for allowing me to speak today. My name is Danielle Christensen, and I'm proud to represent God's Love We Deliver. I will not read my testimony verbatim. I simply want to highlight the work we do for seniors who live with chronic and severe illnesses. For those of you who don't know us, we are the only not-for-profit medically tailored meal provider in New York City that delivers to people who are too sick to shop or cook for themselves. What I mean by medically tailored meals is we, our seven registered dietitians work with each client to develop a meal plan that takes into account their illness, the medications they are taking, and current nutritional guidelines. Dietitians then work directly with our chefs to create a meal plan, all made from scratch in our kitchen. Last year alone, we delivered 1.7 million meals to 7,000 clients, their children, and caregivers. About 65% of those clients were seniors. What we know is many seniors need our meals. Chronic illness is on the rise for older, ad older adults. 92% of seniors in the United States are living with at least one chronic illness. 72% are living with more than one chronic <coughs> illness. Individuals with chronic health conditions account for approximately 86% of all health care spending. Combined with the fact that 75% of seniors were unable to shop for food on their own and 58% were unable to prepare their own food means there is a need for our services. If you are a senior living with a chronic illness in New York City and are unable to shop or cook, God's love is the only option. Last year, 4,402 New York City seniors received over 1 million meals from God's love. Over 65% of these services were supported with private funding, which gets harder and harder to raise each year. For certain populations, this percent is higher. For seniors with end-stage renal disease, which disqualifies individuals from eating meals from DIFTA-funded agencies, over 93% of the meals we deliver to this population are funded through private donations. We receive many referrals from DIFTA for seniors with chronic illness despite having no contractual relationship with them. Because of this, we urge DIFTA to issue an RFP for the provision of medically tailored specialty meals for the senior population most at risk for malnutrition, hospitalization, and institutionalization. God's Love We Deliver is also eager to hear what topic area the consultants hired by DIFTA have in their purview and is interested in working together to address the needs of severely ill seniors. Thank you. Good afternoon, and I also would like to thank you for this hearing and all the amazing work City Council has done this year. Um, my name is Bill Dion. I'm the executive director of the Carter Burden Network. We have 13 different programs throughout Manhattan, four of which are senior centers. And they range from Roosevelt Island to, the, uh, to um, East Harlem, uh, NYCHA building site, and, and throughout. I'm going to not read this testimony because much have been, has been said, so I don't want to be redundant although I would like to also speak to some of the issues that you've raised. Um, I think that it's important to look at the historical perspective of the meals, and that is that before the Older Americans Act, there were articles of people that were living on cat food. And so the whole point of the meal delivery was, we, oh my God, we've got to do something about this. People are starving and they're eating cat food. We have to do something. Well, hooray, we've done something. We're now at a point where we really do need to look at what else can we do that's effective. I think great strides have been made through DIFTA. The idea that there are approved menus, I think, have helped abundantly. I, I'm afraid I remember the day walking into a senior center where they were serving peas, hot dogs, and french fries. And while I may find that delicious, it's not really what we should tout as being healthy for folks to eat. So I, we have made progress, but there's so much more we need to do. And I think in, in the whole idea of, I have been had the pleasure of working with City Meals with regards to the whole oral health issue. And just to put that in perspective, when you realize that almost a third of the people that are receiving a home delivered meal or in a senior center are looking at their plate and cannot eat something on the plate, that's an issue. And it's an issue that I believe can be fixed and, and not with great difficulty. In our senior centers, we offer three choices a day. So a person can come in and they can order main plate they can order a veggie burger or they can order a salad. So it would be very, 
and it's a very cost-effective way because there's much less waste because whatever was served earlier in the week, such as a salmon, can then be turned into a salad. So there's very little waste. It is a way of looking at food a little bit differently. I think that it would be very easy to offer a soft option. What, so when people check in, what they'll do is they are going through the payment issue, which I would actually like to speak to a bit, but they're also making a choice as to which one of the three options they're having. It would be very easy, to, and they get a color tile, which will say what it is they're eating because they're served restaurant style. So it would be very easy to add a soft option. And as importantly, when you look at health, many people are on blood thinners, Coumadin, or something of that nature. We shouldn't even be serving them salad. We don't necessarily know that information. But the individual would be able to say, I need a, a non-leafy uh, item. So it's, I think there are easy fixes to this. Is that even what you though mean by a soft option? No, I'm saying two different things. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. Soft is for Still folks that can't shoot. Thanks. I, I, I knew you would. Um, soft is for those folks that can't eat things that are being served to them. And, and that there is a very large percentage of that happening every day. The leafy vegetable is for folks that are on blood thinners. They shouldn't be eating lettuce, as an example. There are several things they shouldn't. We don't have that information. They know individually. So, again, it's giving them the opportunity to provide us with what it is they need. They should have that choice as an option. Um, the, the contribution DIFTA, and we know exactly where the money's going, to your point, Councilwoman Chin, and that is that it's the bottom line of our budget. It's within our Department for the Aging budget for our senior center. So just as an example, last year in one of our centers, I said that we would get donations of $50,000. So within that 50000 it's cost out what's going for food, what's going for salary. So we said we were going to get $50,000 when, in fact, we got $32,000. So when you look at the bottom line of our budget, there's a shortfall of 18000 Just using that as an example, when you were asking, well, how do we know what the money's being used for? Um, I want to know that. So the whole idea of when you think of how many chickens are bought in the you know throughout the year in senior centers, when you hear this number, the whole idea of group purchasing is absolutely. I know that is something that Live On has looked at for several years and and tried to work with, but it's really something that could be looked at and much more efficient. So when you talk about um, the style of food, I have senior centers. I do catering for other senior centers. I have a program on Roosevelt Island where the kitchen is absolutely inappropriate, so I can't cook there, so I am catering in. And I have absolutely found that the cost of providing the meals in my own kitchen are ch is cheaper. And more importantly than cheaper, as far as I'm concerned, is quality, because I have complete control of the quality of the meal that I'm serving. Bear with me. I'm just, I have been writing throughout this whole thing. I do also, if I might, to your point, Councilwoman Chin, is when you're looking at senior centers and meals, you really do have to look at the whole idea of people coming together and and combating isolation and loneliness. Uh, there have been report after report of, of how poorly this affects people's health if they are lonely and don't feel that there's a place where they can go. And people are not going to walk into a senior center and say, oh my God, I'm here because I'm lonely. It's much easier to say I'm here for a meal. All of this being said, the, I, I so applaud the Department for Aging's look at right-sizing the budget for senior centers. I have a center that's funded 
to my thinking more appropriately than others, and that is a seven-day-a-week program, to your point, and I absolutely see the need for the folks coming in on the weekend, and they're not necessarily the people that are coming during the week, although certainly to a large percentage they are. I also utilize the sixth meal, which there's a line for people on Thursdays and Fridays. We offer it two days a week, and there is a line for people purchasing those meals. We sell out every single time. I think I, I'm finished. And that was the short version. <laughs> yeah, that. <laughs> That's how you started. Uh, right. Well, thank you. I mean, thank you for addressing some of the questions that came up. And, and as advocates, you know, we appreciate, you know, your advocacy, your input, your partnership. And that's why we're so happy that we were able to achieve, you know, um, the budget that we were able to get for um, the year of the senior. And we're going to continue. It's going to be the decade. All right? And then I think when I saw Bobby the other day, he said, well, let's work towards the century. Okay. So let, let's one step at a time. But we definitely have to build on. Uh, the gains that we have made. And we want to make sure that every senior can access a nutritious meal and uh, to be able to come to a center and share with their friends. So thank you for yeah. all the great works and that you do. Just one quick, and Rachel, you brought up a question that we should have had at the last hearing when we were grilling Accessoride uh, on right. technological <laughs> improvements. Yeah. And you said about paper. Could you maybe just expand? Because uh, I don't sure. think that's been mentioned ever before. In the <laughs> The Nothing's drop wrong with off paper, system right. and the whole chaos that goes right. into Right, I mean, the basically for Meals on Wheels, there's a, a, literally a route sheet. It's a sheet of paper um, that is given to the deliverers, and when they go to deliver the meal, there's maybe some notes or comments, some information, important information on there. And then that paper comes back, and it's reporting who got their meals, who didn't get their meals, if there was something amiss with the, the recipient. I mean, everybody has a smartphone. I, I'm sure that there's an app out there. Except my parents. But, <laughs> but you know what? M deliverers should, that, that should be funded. Mm -hmm. uh, smartphones for deliverers so that Mrs. Smith can also sign or maybe press down on a button so that when she calls two hours later because she has a little bit of dementia and says, my meal wasn't delivered, we can say, I, I understand that you don't think it was. Why don't you go and look in your refrigerator? Or if Mrs. Smith falls on the floor, immediate, more immediate help. Or if... We're going and we're driving around Midtown and this crazy, you know, the Christmas tree and everything. Mrs. Smith can be rerouted behind Mr. Jones because the GPS system is working. So instead of trying, because I know Mrs. Smith is next, I can only go to Mrs. Smith. Those kinds of things to really speed up the process and modernize it. I mean, why, why are we filing away papers at all anymore? So that kind of, that kind of stuff. Well, those are the things that Other parts of the, the country use apps for Meals on Wheels. Upstate. So we need to expand the state. Yeah, Those are other the parts country. of the country. <laughs> <laughs> that's other parts. Well, that's what we always say. They don't have to say they that. Hate us. And there's so much. I think you're you're always your advocacy is always teaching us for legislation, budget, future hearings. So we always thank you. And I, I can't believe you're the only provider for medically provided meals. And so you say, how many do you know, have a percentage of how many times DIFTA or how many clients that DIFTA refers to you? I don't personally have that number. That would be interesting. Yeah. I, I think, think especially since there's that partnership cooperation, and these are the type of things that we need to look at, mm -hmm. and there's not really another option. It's about 30%. See, I was waiting for the voice behind the curtain. <laughs> so you didn't know that one? <laughs> the 30%. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Happy holidays. Yes, thank you. Uh, we're going to call up the next panel. Nora Morant, United Neighborhood Houses. Andrea Tiafani, Live On New York. Mira Vanupal, uh, India Home, Allison Simon Brown uh, Hanick. Anyone else that wish to testify, please make sure uh, you fill out a slip with the sergeant. Feel free to jump in whenever you like. Okay, great. So thank you. Um, my name is Nora Moran. I'm a senior policy analyst at United Neighborhood Houses. We are New York City's Federation of Settlement Houses. 
38 members serving 750,000 New Yorkers each year. Um, you know, to build upon many of the comments that were made earlier today, you know, we know that meal programs are a really important part of supportive services for older adults since good nutrition is such a key determinant of health outcomes as we age. Um, settlement houses you know, play a really big role in this in New York. Uh, they're serving 1.3 million congregate meals to 48,000 people through their neighborhood and innovative senior centers. Um, and they're serving 1.4 million meals through their home delivered meal programs to about 6,000 older adults each year. Um, and our members strive to operate you know, senior centers and home delivered meal programs that are high quality, that are responsive to the needs and preferences of older people. Um, in recent years, they've identified, like many others, a greater need for a variety in their meal offerings, mainly around culturally appropriate meals, um, as well as you know, meals that are responsive to health issues such as diabetes, oral issues, et cetera. Um, and you know, they have identified that cost is often the biggest barrier in order to be able to meet those needs. Um, we've been doing some work with them to understand that a little bit more and see what some of those costs look like. Um, and we have been looking at, there was a recent national evaluation that the Administration on Community Living did of all the Administration on Aging Nutrition programs um, to understand both outcomes and true costs of what those, what those meal programs are. Um, so that evaluation found that the average true cost of a home delivered meal is $11.06 um, to offer a point of comparison in the UNH network. Um, lead contractors with a home delivered meal contract receive $8.12 from DIFTA to provide their meals. Um, and the congregate side of things, um, the average cost of a congregate meal nationally is $10.69. Um, and in the UNH network, among neighborhood senior centers, their average reimbursement rate is $7.98. So, you know, some of our members incur deficits in order to, you know, run these programs and meet the needs of their local communities. Um, and without these, you know, without an increased reimbursement rate, it's a challenge to, you know, offer the culturally and nutritionally appropriate meals that people are interested in, retain staff, you know, offer competitive wages, et cetera. Um, so we would, you know, obviously love to see an increased reimbursement rate more in line with some of that analysis of what the true cost of meal provision actually is. Um, and we'd also love to see a greater set of providers be able to refer for home delivered meals. Um, currently, if you are you know, in need of a home delivered meal, you have to go through a DIFTA case management organization in order to you know, eventually get that meal turned on. Um, a lot of our members run NORC programs and there are case managers within the NORC who you know, are capable of also doing that assessment for meals, but then find that they have to refer someone to you know, a case management contractor when sometimes the NORC program and the home delivered meal program for that area are run by the same organization. So it's referring someone externally to only have them be referred back to them for a different program. So you know, streamlining that would obviously um, make it a more seamless experience for clients, which is what our members want, um, and reduce some of the administrative burden on their end as well. Um, and finally, just to speak to an example of um, you know, farm to table and, and local produce was raised before. Um, just to give an example of some something that's happening on that, um, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, who's a settlement house and UNH member organization, has started a program called the Teaching Kitchen, uh, which is a training and technical assistance program that helps nonprofit organizations with uh, institutional food programs serving low income clients to either convert their programs to or accelerate their programs toward a farm to institution model of serving meals. Um, being able to do it within you know, the cost of their current contracts, you know, they identify different uh, produce suppliers to work with, they do a lot of work with Grow NYC, um, and so far they've trained 22 organizations to date on how to change their menus and, and offer more uh, you know, farm to table offerings. Um, and you know, it's for the organizations that have gone through the training, they found it really interesting, um, you know, resistance initially to some of those menu changes, but once the changes actually happen, um, you know, they get very positive reviews from clients coming to the center um, and, and eating those meals. So just an example of some good work that's happening in the city, and I'm sure they'd be happy to share some of that with you directly as well if you were interested. So thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Andrea Chanfrani. I'm with Live On New York. Um, 
Council Member Chin, Council Member Vallone, your incredible staff, thank you all for the, your leadership this year. We, we were really proud to be advocating with our, our advocate partners as well as um, standing strong to, to make this the year of the senior. And we, we truly appreciate your leadership. We know that that took a lot to make it happen and, and we're very proud to be here today. Um, we also very much thank um, Mayor de Blasio as well as the speaker and the finance chair for the 1.2 million in new baseline funding for the congregate and home delivered and weekend meals and as part of this year of the senior campaign. And that's obviously what we're here talking about today. Um, I echo what several of my colleagues have said. Um, again, Live on New York represents um, about 100 members, citywide community-based agencies that offer a wide variety of services to older adults, including senior centers, serving congregate meals, home-delivered meals. So this is a really important part of our members' work and what they value very highly. And, and I'm very glad to be here talking at this hearing today about this subject. Um, as uh, the Older Americans Act is mentioned often today, and at, in, at inception, senior centers, which were born out of the OAA, were aimed at providing nutritional services, which are often lacking for seniors and still today throughout the U.S. The model is expanded for senior centers to include other services, as we all know, that are very much valued. But really, we know that meals are still a, a big part of this program and at the heart of senior centers. Uh, the value of these congregate meals for the lives of thousands of New Yorkers remains very, very important and um, very, very valued. Food insecurity remains a harsh reality of daily life for many New Yorkers. With 250 million meals needed to reach food security for all and demand for nutrition services remains significant for seniors. This is highlighted by the fact that one in six seniors struggles with hunger in the U.S., this inadequate nutrition, as we know, especially in older adults, can exacer exacerbate other health conditions and make things worse. So we, we're re very proud to represent a network that is focused on providing solutions and helping reduce those, those possible concerns. A couple of things we wanted to highlight about uh, home delivered meals and congregate meals is that they combat more than just the strains of food insecurity. We've had many people talk here today about isolation and not just walking in, you know, to say I'm lonely. It was a great quote. Um, it's, it's really the idea of going somewhere and being able to access um, all sorts of services and, and not having the stigma or any of that associated with it. Um, congregate meals are a nutritious meal and an opportunity for socialization with peers and it improves lives um, a, and a point that we've made at several times at hearings but we feel is really important to keep making is that isolation has been found to be a greater predictor of, of death than obesity. Uh, further attended by nearly 30,000 seniors daily, senior centers provide these critical nutri nutrition and socialization services. Home delivered meals are also very important here in New York City and nationwide. It's been well documented. Meals on Wheels America of America found that 92% of seniors say home delivered meals enable them to remain in their homes. Um, this is also seen, as Rachel mentioned, as reducing the cost of other highly um, more expensive um, needs. And we really value the work that, that home delivered meals providers do and, and as well. So getting to some you know, kind of specific recommendations around this, we all know that they're the value that meals provide and some of the challenges that we're facing. Um, we feel that we must ensure the programmatic success of both home delivered and congregate meals by modernizing the programs. Um, you know, the city has changed over the years. A recent report um, said that 2015 said that almost 50% of older New Yorkers were foreign born, reflecting a, signif a significant need for meals that are culturally appropriate as well as diversity and other health requirements that impacts the, the need for meals. DIFT is senior center standards. Um, according to them, providers must offer menus that are appropriate to participants' cultural backgrounds. And this requirement that senior centers must fulfill brings a fiscal implication. For example, in 2015, DIFTA stated that in DIFTA's home delivered meal network, each catered kosher meal is an average of $1.38 more than non-kosher catered meals. And that goes for other types of um, meals that need to be provided. So there's a real um, fiscal um, impact on this, this cost increase, which leads us to the fact that we also advocate that the city must fully reimburse all providers for all types of meals and support the provider's efforts to serve culturally inappropriate meals as needed. 
The other main issue that you've referred to already today is the rising cost of food and not keeping pace with the reimbursement rate. And that is something that we've been talking about for many years, and we will be back here next year talking about the same thing if we don't start addressing it. So I'm very glad that you brought it up. Um, just some quick stats. From 2008 to 2013 alone, the cost of food increased 11% according to the Consumer Price Index. And as in inflation continues to rise, the system must be put in place to automatically reimburse providers for the full cost of each meal rather than constantly reimbursing at an insufficient rate because the system will continue to uh, suffer and that's not going to help. Um, these recommendations are supported by the findings of Live on New York's recently held membership conve convening titled Senior Center's Visions and Priorities for the Future. Um, we were doing this as really part of talking about the model budget process, which we could talk for days about, and we will continue to talk for days about, so I'm glad you brought that up, because again, all of this is tied together. But we really were excited to bring together our member agencies to talk about what their vision is for the future of senior centers. And a big part of that, obviously, as I've already mentioned, is meals. Um, when talking about their priorities and looking at how to serve older adults today and in the future, we found that members overwhelmingly identified enhanced nutrition capabilities was one of the top priorities. So we know not just from what we're all saying here, we know hearing from our members who are doing the, you know, the work on the ground each day that this is on the, the forefront of what they need to look at and what we'll continue, um, we'll need to support. I wanted to offer um, a couple responses. I know I'm glad you raised the issue as well about um, the voluntary contributions. Um, one of the important things that we've um, learned from our work, both from hearing from our members as well as our social workers that do direct outreach signing, um, trying to help seniors enroll in benefits, such as SNAP, um, you know, is the stigma associa associated with receiving anything, whether that be a SNAP or um, meals at a senior center. Um, and so I think that that's something we always talk about is just to be aware of is, um, you know, when, with school lunches, with the free meals for all, the idea is to re re remove that stigma so that one person's getting a free meal versus the second one who's sitting next to them that isn't. So stigma is always important no matter what kind of, um, no matter what kind of meal is being offered. Um, and I think the other thing about voluntary uh, contributions that we're very focused on and talking with our members about was brought up today as well is, um, you know, in the spirit of the OAA, the voluntary contributions are allowed, but, um, you know, the, I believe the standards talk about not being coercive or not, um, you know, not being pressured and not feeling, again, tied to the stigma. So I think that that's something really important to look at that we're really, you know, looking at as well as to, um, you know, we know that that's an important part, but we also know that, um, you know, members don't want seniors to feel uncomfortable about, uh, about that being an issue. So I think that's something we're focused on. The last thing I'll add, um, I know that it affects budgets as well as um, several providers have talked about is um, if you're not making a certain amount of money in those contributions, then um, providers having to kind of pick up the piece of that. Um, and I know that that's a challenge and I know that that could be tied in on how you're trying to get those contributions. So all of it's connected and it's just um, something we're going to continue to look at and obviously talk to our members about and bring feedback to you all and, and to DIFTA as well as we all work together to um, continue these successful programs. So thank you for the opportunity to talk today. Thank you. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, I'll start again. <laughs> um, thank you for the opportunity to be here, Chairman Margaret Chin and uh, Council Member Paul Vallone. My name is Meera Venugopal and I am with uh, India Home. And India Home is the only community-based nonprofit in the New York area serving the needs of a wide variety of, of, uh, of South Asian diaspora senior, uh, seniors uh, from Bangladesh, India, Indo-Caribbean, Pakistani, and other South Asian seniors. We provide classes, meals, and events at our four centers in Queens. Uh, we run congregate meal programs at four of our centers. Our Desi Senior Center in Jamaica, Queens, runs the largest senior center congregate halal meal program in New York City, serving culturally appropriate halal meals to over 120 mostly Bangladeshi Muslim seniors every program day. At our Sunnyside Center, Kew Gardens, and Richmond Hill Centers, we serve vegetarian, Hindu, and Jain meals to over 100 Indian and Indo-Caribbean patrons. So one of the main reasons keeping South Asian seniors from accessing mainstream centers is the food. Um, 
many senior centers serve congregate meals. Um, a shared meal helps to combat the social isolation so many seniors suffer from, and often is the only way for poor seniors to get a nutritional meal. However, the food in mainstream <coughs> senior centers may not suit everyone, especially South Asians who have many restrictions on what kind of food they can eat. So a substantial percentage of, Hindu, of Indians are Hindu and vegetarian. Many Pakistanis and Bangladeshis have strict religious in injunctions about what they may or may not eat. For instance, halal food, uh, as I'm sure you know, is an integral part of Islam and as a subset of one of the main five pillars of the religion, Muslims are mandated to eat only halal food to maintain their faith. Um, because we serve culturally appropriate food at our centers, we are able to target an un underserved and ignored segment of se seniors in New York City. According to the Center for Urban Futures report in New York City alone, um, between 2000 and 2010, the population of older immigrants from India grew by 135%, uh, and the number of Bangladeshi immigrants from Bangladesh grew in the previous de decade from four by 471%. Uh, the Pakistani populations grew by 38% from 2008 to 2011. So the borough of Queens, where we have our centers, is home to some of the largest South Asian populations in the country. Studies have shown that, that congregate meals promote health, help tackle food insecurity faced by low-income seniors, increase nutrition intake, and more importantly, encourage conversation and camaraderie. Some of our seniors live alone or have chronic health conditions or may be at nutrition risk. For many of our seniors, that shared warm meal is one of the best reasons to visit our centers. So um, given the huge and growing population of South Asian seniors, it's imperative that there be a concentrated effort to make culturally appropriate meals that, is, that cater to these populations available. It's also important to reach homebound seniors who may be older, as, as you know, all my colleagues here have said, they may be highly vulnerable and at risk of social isolation. Home delivered meal drivers may be the sole social contact for meal recipients and may also report safety or unhealthy environmental concerns back to agencies. So home delivering culturally appropriate meals will allow us to support our desire to promote healthy aging and food security and allow all older adults to experience stable health and age in place. More importantly, it will help in reducing and or impacting the racial equity disparity that now exists in home delivered meal plans and ensure healthy aging for all. Uh, we at India Home are ready to you know, provide expertise, partner with all of you to make these kinds of things happen. Thank you so much for your time. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Allison simmons Brownley. Um, I'm from Hanek. Uh, I'm the director of the, the Hanek uh, Innovative Senior Center in Astoria, the Hanek Harmony JVL Senior Center. Um, we, uh, we serve over 2,000 individuals at our center annually about 700 in a week, and we provide meals uh, that we cook on site, and we're at the very lowest end of the reimbursements uh, for raw food uh, level, right, uh, but around 276. Uh, and, and we do definitely rely upon um, the uh, voluntary contributions to, to, to fill that out. Uh, many, many things that I, I wish to say were, were, were spoken eloquently by my colleagues, um, but my, my desire as a director and Hennick's desire is to serve the most people possible, um, the most needy people. And there are people that are not coming to our congregate program because we are not providing culturally appropriate meals, specifically Asian and South Asian, people that are within our community that I can see and that I do outreach to, but our food is just not, it's not what they're looking for. Um, if we had a, if, you know, in-house, in if we had a higher, higher amount of money, we could provide different options, even medically appropriate options. Soft food, that's a real issue in our center, and people do stop coming, or they ask to take their food home, which is not encouraged, because they'll need to puree it. Um, now, uh, of course, uh, home-delivered meals are what we're here to talk about today, and that's uh, something I, I would just encourage. I, I think that there should be a cost study to see the different costs, um, uh, what these meal numbers are for different centers and these and these providers, because I do believe that um, in-house cooked meals are cheaper and better, and that the people who are cooking them and that have a relationship with the seniors who have their feet on the ground in these communities would be the best people to hold those contracts, not outside people who are going to have outside caterers. 
um, or we could you know cater from each other to have culturally appropriate meals. And I think it would be a savings of money, and I think the food would be better, and um, and it would also keep people within the network of these senior centers. If someone is, um, um, sorry, I have a little bit of a cold. If if someone is homebound temporarily or is released to the hospital and needs home delivered meals, they're still in the hands of their trusted senior center network, so that hopefully they'll be able to come back and receive the supportive services that we're providing and, and so socialize with their friends and live longer and, and stay, staying at home longer, living longer in your home independently. This, this, is, this, is, less, this is less expensive than a long stay in a rehab, than a long stay in you know, hospice. It, it's better for everyone, so that's all. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for your testimony. I think um, for, you know, um, for Live On and, and for um, UNH, I mean, we are going to rely on, on your organization to really help us to bring the providers together and kind of work with DIFTA to make sure that we got to get a handle on this um, because we just can't wait until the next RFP. Um, there's got to be some solution. And I think there are a lot of great suggestions that came out of the hearing that we can, you know, provide more nutritious meal at reasonable cost and if everybody kind of work together uh, so far that we uh, we look forward um, to your leadership and your support on this on this issue as always thank you to our advocates thank you for the ideas like the uh, the teaching kitchen you know these are all things that we can use right in our own neighborhoods to try to learn from and again it's a small amount of reimbursement costs and funding to be able to provide these additional meal options, whether it's within our Asian community, our South Asian community, our Jewish community, our Muslim communities, Greek, Italian, you name it, it's, it's so much of the, the meal identifies with the culture, which identifies with the senior and the way to attach to the home and some meaning of what happened in their life. As an Italian, I know my meal means very, very much to me. Uh, I, somebody said there was Italian meals being offered somewhere in the city. I'd like to find it besides in my Sunday at my house. but. Um, this is important, so we're going to continue to fight for the city budget, and thank you, everyone. You're too young to go to the city uh, budget. I'm over 50 now. Yeah. <laughs> 60. <laughs> thank you. Um, before I adjourn the final committee hearing uh, on aging hearing this term, I want to say what an honor it has been uh, to serve as chair of this committee uh, and advocate for the growing senior population throughout New York City. It's a privilege to be a senior. It's a privilege to be able to grow old in the greatest city in the world. And for many of us, lifelong or nearly lifelong New Yorkers, it's a privilege to be able to age with dignity in the neighborhoods that we help build. But sometimes we need the help and the resources to do that. And that is why the work that this committee does is so important. We fight for some of the most vulnerable New Yorkers, and I'm proud that all of us um, that all that we have accomplished in the last four years. We expanded the SCREE and SHE program to make sure that seniors can continue to stay in their community. Um, we made social adult daycare more transparent to give our caregivers peace of mind. In fact, we invigorated at the conversation about how our city is taking care of our caregivers. And we jump-started the conversation about how to continue the expansion of NORCs as a model to deliver services to our seniors. Now so many of my colleagues are asking us how can they start one in their own neighborhood. And last but not least, we dramatically increased DIFTA's funding, which include the historic year of the senior budget. I have so many people to thank for the success of this committee. I want to thank our speaker, Melissa Mark Riverito, and Finance Chair Julissa Ferreras Copeland for their leadership throughout the budget process. Um, you know, when women, especially women of color, we know how to get things done. <laughs> so I also wanted to thank our committee member, especially our chair on the subcommittee on Senior Center, Council Member Paul Below. Such a great partner. I hope we can continue. Um, and also a big thank you to uh, all the staff, our council um, from previous uh, council, Kelly Taylor, we had Eric Bernstein, Alex uh, Polinoff, and now we have Caitlin Fahey. And then our analysts, we had James Sabuti, 
And now we have Emily Rooney and our finance analyst. We have Dohina Sapora, who has been with me the entire four-year term. And we also have Brittany Morrissey now. She is at DIFTA. And Daniel Koop. Um, I also wanted to thank all the advocates, all of you out there, uh, who bring seniors every year to gently remind us and remind the mayor and the administration to remember the seniors. And lastly, I wanted to thank the Department for the Aging, our Commissioner Donna Corrado, uh, Deputy Commissioner Carolyn Resnick, and all the staff at DIFTA. Even though we do not always agree on everything, I never doubted that we are moving toward the same goal to ensure that our senior live their best lives. With that, I want to thank all of you for attending today's hearing, and I wish all of you a wonderful holiday and a happy, healthy new year, and I look forward to working with all of you in the new term. Thank you again, and we're adjourned.